Good morning and uh, welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of OMWA, thanks to everyone who's joined us this morning to be part of this very important conversation on COVID-19 and for the discussion of relevant issues and sharing of information as it relates to the water and wastewater industry. As of last count, uh, we were closing in on 500 registr registrants for the uh, webinar, which is an amazing um, um, accomplishment and really speaks to the importance of, of what we're talking about today. Uh, my name is Mike Mortimer, President of the OMWA and Manager of Environmental Services for the City of Stratford. I'll be your host for today's proceedings. I know it's been a challenging time for all of us in the last couple of weeks, both from a professional and personal perspective. We are facing an unprecedented time and adapting to an ever-changing environment, not only at work, but at home as well, with challenges such as homeschooling, coping with family dynamics, job loss, economic uncertainty. I strongly believe that sharing of information such as we are doing this morning makes us stronger collectively as an industry and provides comfort knowing that we're all going through the same issues together. I know with family, we gain strength in times like this by touching, keeping in touch and checking in on each other. I'd like to think that's kind of what we're doing this morning. I'm so very pleased to introduce and welcome Nicole McClellan from Stantec. Nicole, along with the Stantec team of David Pernitsky, Joe Jackangelo and Art Umbel, we're all contributors to the white paper entitled Introduction to Coronaviruses. And it is this paper that forms the basis for the presentation this morning. On behalf of the OMWA and its members, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Stantec and the entire team for their overwhelming willingness to making this webinar today a reality. The goal of the webinar today is to help water and wastewater utilities and prof professionals by providing relevant information surrounding COVID-19 and to allow the sharing of information and ideas. The hope is that this will result in consistent communication, not only within organizations, but across the industry. At this time, it is my pleasure to again introduce Nicole McClellan to begin her presentation, COVID-19, Considerations for Water and Wastewater Management. Thank you very much, Mike. It is, hello everyone, good morning. Ontario Water and Wastewater. It's really my pleasure to um, share with you what myself and my co-authors dug up on uh, COVID-19 for our industry this morning. This presentation brings together two of my um, areas of expertise. I'm gonna share my screen now. There we go. Um, I have a background in microbiology and I've been focusing on the detection of human viruses in water um, as part of my PhD and I've been with Stantec for more than nine years, mostly focusing on optimization of municipal treatment and uh, disinfection processes. So our goal for this presentation is to share the facts on COVID-19 and coronaviruses in general. We want the focus here is to benefit uh, public health protection to ensure we have proper protection for operators based on the science that we know right now and protection of the public, for example, with potential CSOs uh, and answer other questions that you might have. So we did receive some questions in advance and I've tried to incorporate those answers into the presentation um, and we will have a Q&A at the end. You can send in your questions using the box in Zoom, the Q&A pop up there and uh, we'll consolidate those questions and try to address them at the end. And also the presentation is being recorded and the slides will be also available after the presentation. So if you have to attend to family, um, hopefully I don't have to do that, but then we can just carry on uh, uninterrupted. So at Stantec, we always like to start with a safety moment. And I think it's important at this time for in, in the concept of keeping us healthy to stay active while we're working from home. So the recommendation is to move every 90 minutes. You could do that by setting a timer. Um, set a daily step goal, use the stairs where you are, jog on the spot, um, have an active meeting, so take your phone call, standing up, walking around, pacing around, uh, or even stretching at your desk at that 90 minute interval to, um, to stay active there, keep the blood flowing. So let's look at what we're gonna cover today. Our agenda includes an introduction to coronaviruses, which will also include um, viruses 101. Uh, I think it's important that we all get on the same page about what a virus is. We're often used to talking about bacteria in our industry and E. coli as an indicator of the performance of treatment for pathogens. And viruses are a little bit different. So we'll address that first and look at what we know about how viruses um, might persist in water. Then we'll look at the treatment efficacy and 
then get to your operator considerations, which I think you're all very curious about what the recommendations might be at this time, and then how to address the public. For the summary, we have an infographic uh, that we have prepared uh, that you can also use. And many of the slides within the presentation might be good posters for you to use as well. Um, so I'm timing my presentation. I hope to leave, I promise to leave at least 15 minutes for Q&A. So let's jump in here. We really felt like it was our responsibility as industry practitioners to share the information that we dug up on COVID, uh, but we need to provide a disclaimer because we know this is a novel virus, it's new, and there's new information coming in all the time. Um, so I'm just gonna get my pointer up. Let's just have that available. So um, I just want to sort of disclose that uh, the information that we have right now may change. So on to viruses 101, not the most exciting way to start a presentation, um, but again, it's important that we all understand what a virus is so we can interpret the science and how that impacts our industry. So we know that viruses are biological entities. They really only need two components. They need a genome, which can be made of either RNA or DNA, DNA like us humans, or RNA, which is a very similar molecule, uh, molecular makeup and then a protein capsid. So as long as it has these two components, the genome and the capsid, uh, we call that a virion, and it potentially could be infectious or cause an infection. Some viruses also have an additional envelope, like COVID-19. And so we'll talk a little bit about how that impacts what we know about viruses like that. We know that viruses need a host cell to replicate. They don't replicate on their own in the environment, and they're pretty host specific. So they reproduce and cause infection by binding to a receptor on the surface of your, your cell, being the host cell, could be, for example, a human lung cell. So they look for a specific protein on the surface of cells, and then they will convince the cell to take them up. And once they enter the cell, they take over the cell machinery to create or package numerous virus progeny or um, new viruses, new replications of themselves. And so these progeny are then packaged, their genomes are replicated, new copies of their genomes are made inside the host cell, as well as proteins to make new capsids. And then um, when they're released, they're either released by rupturing your host cell or by budding out of the host cell. And COVID-19, we suspect, does this, and it takes some of that membrane material with it, those um, phospholipids, and some of its own proteins to make that envelope. So that's a little bit more susceptible to disinfection, which we'll get to. We know that COVID-19 is a zoonotic virus. So viruses, as I said, tend to have a very narrow host range um, of species that they will infect. So COVID-19 likely only infects humans. Other strains of coronaviruses, of course, could infect other species. We know that zoonotic viruses originate in an animal species and then evolve to infect humans. And viruses tend to have higher mutation rates than other uh, microbial pathogens, and that allows them to evolve more rapidly. That's probably one reason why we don't see these sort of pandemics from bacterial or parasitic um, pathogens. The other important note here on viruses is how we detect them. Because when you hear in the news that, oh, they detected virus in stool or in wastewater treatment plant. It depends on what method they use with respect to the human health impact or human health risk. So the first common method that's used is a culture method, and that's where we will grow mammalian cells in a lab, usually a mono layer, and then we'll essentially wash your water sample over that and look for plaques or evidence that uh, the cells were actually infected by something in that water sample. And because viruses tend to be fairly host specific, uh, we can try to talk about uh, whether those viruses in that sample, what species, what strain they were and um, how infectious they were. And the second way we might look for viruses in the environment or in water is using a molecular method where we target uh, a piece, a section of their genome or the whole genome, uh, the piece of DNA or RNA, usually by PCR. And that doesn't tell us if that virus was infective. It just tells us that a piece of its DNA or RNA was present in the water sample. So again, that virus needs that genome and the capsid or envelope intact in order to cause infection. 
So we got our 101 out of the way, and now you all know a lot more about viruses than you did 10 minutes ago. So let's look more closely at specifically coronaviruses. So these are envelope viruses with RNA genomes. They're generally categorized into two groups. And the main point of this slide is to point out you know, that we have some had some more recent outbreaks of novel coronaviruses, new viruses that the human population hasn't seen before and probably has very low or no immunity to. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that in this presentation, I'm going to be using the nomenclature COVID-19, although in the scientific literature, we're now seeing it being labeled as SARS-CoV-2. The other thing I will highlight here, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, these viruses mainly cause respiratory infections, although some do cause gastroenteritis, and that's normally in the upper respiratory tract. And, and there's other human coronaviruses that pass around in our, our society um, as like the common cold. So uh, we're not completely new to coronaviruses, but, but we are new to a novel coronavirus. So what can we learn from SARS, which is the last similar outbreak um, uh, with the MERS aside. And so this was a novel respiratory coronavirus outbreak in 32 countries, a similar seasonal time frame, late winter 2002 to about July 2003. We saw less deaths and, and transmission, um, possibly because we think that COVID-19 has a higher um, viral load in the upper respiratory tract, and it, it seems to be transmissible more when you're asymptomatic. Uh, SARS-CoV-1 had a mortality rate of about 10%, which is higher than what we are seeing for um, COVID-19. There was suspected transmission by fecal-oral route. That's really important for our industry to understand as we think about what are the risks to having COVID-19 in the raw wastewater and um, exposure for our operators. So there was some suspected transmission uh, by SARS-1. We uh, at, we researchers asked um, cases if they experienced gastroenteritis and 20 to 40 percent said that they did and we did researchers detected RNA in the feces about four months after a symptom onset and the virus was seen to um, replicate in the intestine and it was isolated by culture from stool which suggests that there was infectious um, SARS-1 in, in feces. We know also that SARS-CoV-1 was susceptible to thermal inactivation, which we believe to also be true for COVID-19. Um, so very susceptible to heat. Um, because it has that sort of fragile envelope and it needs that to cause infection, you know, even common household soap and water can uh, disinfect an area with respect to COVID-19, we suspect. And we know the quarantine measures were very successful because it was primarily passed from person to person. So what do we know now about COVID-19 so far? Again, an enveloped RNA virus, the seventh coronavirus known to infect humans. Of course, we have these three novel ones now. We know it's spread wide. These numbers are as of yesterday. It was quite sobering to be updating these numbers uh, throughout the last week. Um, we suspect that the mortality rate may be uh, between 1% to 5% because these you know, infected cases are likely an underestimate right now. We know it's spread by person-to-person -person contact within two meters. And you might be thinking, what does that mean? You know, if you go for coffee with a friend, um, you know, how could you possibly be transmitting it if you're covering your cough and um, covering your sneeze and using a tissue and washing your hands, that kind of thing. But when you're talking, even just regular communication, you are releasing some droplets in your speech um, or when you clear your throat, that kind of thing. It's not that fun to think about, um, but that is a way that that can transmit. And those droplets can be fairly heavy and fall you know, on someone's cell phone or on the table, and then someone touches that and, and touches somewhere on their face, their eye, nose, or mouth, and, and can contract the virus that way. So that's, that's why we say person-to-person -person contact within two meters. Um, and we know, we all know what the symptoms are. So I'm going to refer to the survival of the virus as the media calls it as persistence because the virus isn't really alive. It doesn't respire, it doesn't consume food or oxygen. It just sort of exists as this entity um, and it's either infectious or non-infectious. So I'm referring to that as persistence. 
And so there was a study done to look at how long it persists by culture detection methods um, in air. And that was through the use of experimental aerosols, which are smaller than what would be passed from person to person. So these probably persist for longer in the air than normal like uh, droplet that a person is producing. <clears throat> and so we know that's fairly short, relatively speaking, three hours. Whereas on surfaces, we learned that uh, the time to persist with respect to being detected by culture was uh, longer on plastics than, for example, copper. Unfortunately, we don't have data with respect to um, you know, concrete for our industry, but, uh, but we know it, it may be transmitted through surfaces. Um, we know that it's, now it's been detected in feces. So we know that some coronaviruses, including SARS-1, uh, do have the capability of binding to human cells in both the lung and the intestine. They bind to this specific receptor protein ACE2 on human cells and um, those are present on all kinds of organs in the human body but they're abundantly expressed in the lung and respiratory tract and in the small intestine. So that gives us a mechanism for how the virus might be present in stool samples. Um, in the Netherlands they were sampling for the RNA the genetic material of the virus in raw wastewater at the Amsterdam airport and at the downstream wastewater treatment plant. And here they detected a positive sample four days after the first person had a confirmed case in the Netherlands. Then viral RNA was detected at the downstream wastewater treatment plant within the first week of the first confirmed case. So there's an interesting time frame there. Um, and we believe from some China studies that the virus is RNA is being detected for several weeks after a person is symptomatic. Um, usually that's someone who's more immunocompromised, but it can be shed for long periods of time, at least the RNA. And then we did, we do have one study that was published um, where they did find what we call active or infectious COVID in feces. So as a con one confirmed case in China, had a sample taken and detected um, COVID-19. And that's what you see in this picture up here is that sort of spiky, large viral particle. You know, these are, these are about 10 to 200 nanometers in terms of viruses, whereas our bacteria are half to one or 10 micron. Um, and so this, this is a coronavirus that was isolated from a stool sample. So the capsid or the envelope is, appears to be intact by electron microscopy and the full genome was also detected in this study. So it's with all this data combined, the science, it tells us that it's possible and probable that there is infectious COVID-19 in raw wastewater in a community that has infected cases. I'm going too fast here. There we go. So let's look at the persistence of coronaviruses in water if we know that they are getting in there. Um, we know that they seem to remain infective for longer in colder water than in warm water. That doesn't mean that this whole thing is going to go away when it gets warmer out. That would be nice. Um, but it tells us that we may need to be more diligent in colder seasons. Um, and again, we know that the viruses don't replicate in the environment. So whatever viral load is coming from the population, it's either going to be that coming into the wastewater treatment plant or less. Get rid of my window here. Okay, so the persistence of water and in water and wastewater, we have two studies that looked at other coronaviruses that infect humans and also non-human coronaviruses where they basically seeded these viruses into various water samples at bench scale and held them at four degrees and 25 degrees. Unfortunately, we don't have data for in between those two values, which is sort of what we're approaching now in our climate here. So we can see uh, this table shows us um, the days to achieve 99% reduction in infectivity. So I'm gonna make sure that you can see my mouse here. So under uh, wastewater samples, uh, samples held at four degrees, we saw that in order to get two log reduction, that took two months possibly or more. And to see that two log reduction at 25 degrees was only um, about a week or less. So it's a significant 
susceptibility to increase in temperature with respect to losing its infectivity. So again, these, these studies were done looking at using a, a culture method. So we know that this is telling us a bit more about how long the virus remains infectious. In lake water, it was about two weeks at 25 degrees, which was a surface water source for uh, North Carolina water. And then uh, in filtered tap water, so they took tap water samples that were, everything here was dechlorinated and, um, and passed those through 0.2 micron in case there was any impact from microbes. And, uh, and we see 110 days um, to achieve two log reduction at four degrees and two to three weeks um, to achieve two log reduction at 25 degrees. So um, this tells us that coronaviruses may persist for a decent amount of time if they are infectious when they enter the water body. So then how effective is treatment? Of course, this is irrelevant if you're working at a wastewater treatment plant around open basins of raw wastewater that's not uh, treated yet. And so um, we have to take extra precaution there now that we have this information. And then we also have a lot of questions about how effective treatment is, especially when we're thinking about CSOs and downstream uses. So I have one more disclaimer, which is that we don't have an extensive body of literature on the effectiveness of water and wastewater treatment with respect to coronaviruses specifically or COVID-19. Um, again, we do have some estimates based on the structure of the virus. Um, we also know that site-specific water quality and treatment performance and design can have a huge impact on the efficacy of treatment for pathogens. So we have to keep that in mind and we want to be diligent during this time. So the efficacy of wastewater treatment for the removal and inactivation of viruses in general um, through secondary wastewater treatment or pre-disinfection, it's highly variable. Studies show just in terms of viruses in general, um, it could be anywhere from not significant to more than two log removal at that point. So we can't estimate what the viral removal might be through that process. And so we are left talking about disinfection. Um, typically here, we're practicing that through chlorination or UV. So coronaviruses are more susceptible to disinfection than other human viruses. Two studies I've cited below did compare um, SARS-1 with uh, other indicators that we're, are, we're commonly using to tell us about the performance in terms of inactivation of pathogens and micro, micro, other microorganisms. So we know E. coli we use very often as an indicator. Phage tends to be more resistant to treatment and poliovirus 1 is a good indicator for human viruses. So we know that coronavirus is more susceptible and that again is likely because of its enveloped nature um, that any sufficient damage to that viral envelope, envelope will be inactivating the virus. It can't bind to your cell, your host cell, and convince it to take it up. Doing a time check? Okay, we're good. So the efficacy of wastewater disinfection with respect to chlorination does depend on numerous water quality factors, such as you know, the presence of disinfectant containing substances like ammonia, which you may remember from your operator training, um, pH, temperature, and other factors, because when that uh, chlorine dose reacts with ammonia, it forms chloramines, and those are generally weaker disinfectants, especially with respect to viruses, um, when compared to free chlorine. One study did look at uh, free chlorine residual of more than 5.5 milligrams per liter for 30 minutes, producing no detectable um, SARS-1 coronavirus, after that level of CT, um, but it's possible that your plant isn't achieving that level of disinfection. And this study had some issues with um, showing us all of the data and uh, a, a fairly low dose uh, initial concentration of SARS-1 of 50 um, particles per milliliter. So, um, so we have to put a little asterisk on that data. Let's dig in a bit more just so we're all clear on the um, free chlorine residual that you may have at your plant if you are applying chlorine. So this is sort of a example graph where you may have one milligram of ammonia as nitrogen in your 
and raw water or your secondary effluent. And essentially, you this also has no chlorine demand, um, but you need to get to break point, this break point threshold in order to start seeing uh, free chlorine residual. And so in this case, with one milligram of ammonia as nitrogen, you actually need to be dosing you know, more than seven and a half milligrams of chlorine to start seeing that free chlorine residual. And if your plant has you know, up to three milligrams per liter of ammonia as nitrogen, you'd need to be dosing chlorine up to maybe 30 milligrams per liter to get to that break point before you have free chlorine residual that can act as a disinfectant towards things like viruses. So you may not want to be relying on chlorine for your wastewater disinfection when it comes to COVID-19. And further, I added this slide to look at viruses in general. How much CT do we need um, with respect to free chlorine or chloramines when it comes to achieving, say, two log inactivation of viruses? So for free chlorine, we're looking at about three milligram or per minute per liter. And um, for chloramines, we're looking at you know, two orders of magnitude more than that. So, um, so we, again, cannot be relying on those chloramines for the inactivation of viruses, unless we have very high doses. So we may also be practicing UV disinfection at our wastewater treatment plant. And you know, it's well documented in the late 90s that uh, UV can be an effective treatment barrier for viruses and often more effective than chlorination because of those chloramine issues. Um, but again, it, there's so many site-specific factors and water quality factors that affect the fluence that's achieved by a UV system that it's really not possible for us to put a number on you know, how effective is UV for um, inactivating viruses or COVID-19. So again, we think that it's probably more susceptible than other viruses um, to inactivation, but uh, we can't put a number on this this uh, disinfection method here. So let's jump now to the drinking water side. Uh, here we're just posting values that are known for viruses in general, mostly pulled from the Health Canada guidelines. So we know that optimized conventional filtration can achieve about two log removal of viruses. We know that free available chlorine practiced um, for four log inactivation of viruses in general is likely also protective for COVID-19. And that uh, UV disinfection, a dose of 44 millijoules per centimeter squared can achieve about three log inactivation of poliovirus one, which is probably a good surrogate for COVID-19. And it's probably not as resistant as adenovirus, which we know to be one of the most resistant viruses to UV. So some over, overall considerations for drinking water treatment at this time are that we may have viruses leaving the wastewater treatment plant that are infectious if we don't have sufficient time there, um, especially if we expect the virus to survive for a couple of days in water under those conditions and your retention time might be half to a day to one day through your wastewater treatment plant, depending on design, then we may be releasing uh, infectious viruses into the environment. And that could be a concern for downstream drinking water treatment plants. So at this time, we're recommending that you ensure that all your disinfection performance is continuously monitored so that you are meeting all of your credits um, or exceeding. But we do expect that common disinfection methods used in water treatment are expected to be effective for the inactivation of coronaviruses when they're operated as designed. At this time, I wanted to make a plug for quantitative microbial risk assessment. This is a statistical tool that water utilities can use to, uh, for example, for emergency preparedness. So if you're feeling unsure about how effective your barriers are for viruses through drinking water treatment, then you can look to using a tool like this. It can help you plan for emergencies, such as how long can you lose chlorination um, or other disinfection um, before you need to be concerned or issue a boil water advisory. It can, it can also help you select and prioritize treatment upgrades. So you can look to the Health Canada guidance document for more information on that. So now we're gonna get to your burning questions on operator considerations. And you know a lot of this will need to be site specific for your um, location and how you manage your staff and how large your utility is. So this is very vague and we can get into more specifics in the Q&A. I provided this uh, poster you can use 
we all have been told this a hundred times. Um, but I think what needs to be considered as well is to be staying home if you're ill and avoiding others who are ill or uh, meet risk, the risk criteria. If someone has been caring for someone who is a known case of COVID-19, that person needs to be quarantined as well. So what are the potential risks to operators? You probably started to put those puzzle pieces together now. We know that uh, wastewater processes may generate droplets and aerosols, which is a method of transmission for COVID-19, as well as surface contamination near those processes or near workers who may be infected and don't know. Um, in the absence of you know, disinfection procedures, sanitation practices, and proper PPE, nearby workers could potentially become infected and they could potentially transmit, of course, that illness to their community or their families. So we wanna look at how we can prevent transmission while these people are still being called to work. Um, and I want to reiterate, WHO states that this virus seems to behave like other coronaviruses and it may persist on surfaces for a few hours up to several days. So we want to be practicing that surface disinfection routinely. One of the questions that comes up a lot is, should you be wearing a mask? And this is one that, <clears throat> a recommendation that I struggle with because a mask can be a vector for transmitting the virus to your face if you don't use it properly. So a mask that's like what's pictured here would need to be applied with very clean hands, disinfected hands if you can, because think about how you're putting that on your face, you're going to be wrapping the strap around your head, you may you know, glaze your eye while you're applying that strap. So we want to be very careful how we're applying the mask and then how we're using it while we're wearing it. Does that actually encourage us to touch our face more as we're adjusting it when you drink from your coffee, if your worker goes for a cigarette or a break? Um, thinking about how effective is that mask for the work that they're doing um, and making sure that it's being disposed of and not reused. Um, so I would lean more towards using face shields um, if they're not working really closely with another person or um, an area where droplets or aerosols are being created. Uh, in the Netherlands, the quotation that I put here, once they detected um, COVID-19 RNA in their raw wastewater, they issued this statement. Standard procedure for wastewater treatment personnel is as follows. During all activities that lead to possible contact with wastewater, they must wear PPE, including protective clothing, gloves, boots, safety glasses, and a face mask or an FFP3 respirator mask. So they're not specifically saying a mask like this, um, but a, a face shield may, may give you uh, similar protection and cause you to encourage you to touch your face less. So I've spoken with a few uh, operators. Aqua provided some information from Region of Waterloo on some of the precautions that they're doing. Um, we know another case in the United States, they're no longer having shift changes. Um, they're not meeting in person, of course, they're meeting online or on the phone between changes, they're wiping everything down. So I sort of provided this list of things to consider that you may or may not be doing at your site. Routinely washing down surfaces that may come in contact with aerosols, um, ensuring those staff are wearing proper PPE. Let me bring back up my printer. Um, ensuring entering manholes right now is not recommended during the pandemic unless deemed critical. Now that you have all this scientific information, you can probably figure out why. And so we want to just limit that exposure to only critical work and making sure PPE is worn and that um, there's a change of clothing happening, that those clothes are being laundered before that person um, you know, has that contact with their family when they get home as well. Um, ensuring that they're wiping down their vehicles I have in here. Um, there was a question about, you know, if you have to work closely with another person, um, how should we go about that? And so we wanna step back a bit from that and think anyone that is going to be participating in work with another person has to first meet the, the acceptable criteria to work on site. So they can't have traveled recently, they must have quarantined for 14 days. They can't have symptoms, they can't have been in contact with the case. Um, and so if all of that is true, 
then um, that person may be approved to work with others on site. And again, we should practice social distancing when we can or have some kind of barrier if they're going to be near the face of another person, I guess. Um, okay, we wanna be in, uh, providing hand sanitizer and refills for those routinely. Um, cleaning and disinfecting common surfaces. So between shift changes, we wanna be wiping down the keyboard, the phone, these commonly touched surfaces, light switches, door handles. Um, and you may want to do your shift changes in a strategic way where there's fewer people you know, changing at the same time and that kind of thing. You want to make sure masks are available for people who may develop a cough or fever on site. That is one area where we do, it is recommended to wear a mask and um, just to prevent transmission once we may suspect that person is a case. Of course, ensure staff who are ill stay home. Um, communicate to your staff if a member becomes ill or is a confirmed case, they, they have a right to know. Um, we want to split. I talked about splitting shifts and I'm sure you're all probably doing that already. Uh, taking separate breaks and meeting that commitment for social distancing of more than six feet. Um, yeah, that's good. So I'm sure we'll dig in more with those in the Q&A. So the last piece under operational guidance is uh, sludge management. So again, it's possible that COVID-19 could be present in raw sewage and settled sludge. The persistence is unknown in this medium right now or this matrix, but if it behaves like other coronaviruses, then um, its persistence in sludge could be on the order of days in a warm environment or weeks in a cold environment. So again, we expect its susceptibility to thermal inactivation to be similar to SARS-1, which was greater than 56 degrees. And, you know, this thermal inactivation may be less than that. So, um, so may not be sufficiently inactivated. And uh, otherwise, right now, we're recommending following the standard guidance for the handling of biosolids and uh, additional PPE if that's not being practiced right now. So at this time, I think Nancy is going to initiate a poll just to see, um, so you'll see it pop up on your Zoom window that you can click on poll, there you are, and you can participate. Um, so there's a couple polls and we're looking at what sort of practices are you conducting at your municipality and that kind of thing. So you can go ahead and answer those poll questions and let's take a little break, a little pause here. Okay, I'm going to move on to addressing the public, our last section before we get into the Q&A. So WHO has you know, overseen a lot of pandemics and um, they're generally the go-to guidance on addressing the public. And they did release a couple of, um, there's their second poll coming up now. Uh, they released a couple of posters to help educate the public on some of the common questions that they were getting. And thought this might be some good comic relief if you're in the mood. Um, one of the questions they received is Ken's common question that they received, can spraying alcohol or chlorine all over your body kill the new coronavirus? Of course, we have issue with the word kill because we know the virus isn't alive, but anyway, and of course the answer is no. Um, and we don't want to misinterpret, you know, how effective treatment barriers can be in our practice with uh, what people can do at home. And the second question that relates to our industry was, can ultraviolet disinfection lamp kill the new coronavirus? And of course, the recommendation was that that's not a safe practice on your person. So some, uh, some ways that WHO is addressing myths with these posters. The main concern for our industry with respect to public safety, next to addressing their questions, which hopefully some of our scientific background will help you phrase those messages if you need to. Um, but the main concern would be overflows. 
So if you have operational combined sewer overflows or bypasses of treatment barriers at the wastewater treatment plant, this could contribute to the release of human viruses in general in the environment, but it could also contain what we suspect to be low levels of potentially infectious COVID-19. And their persistence in natural waters is uh, currently unknown. If it does behave similar to that of other coronaviruses, then it may be on the order of weeks in warm conditions to months in cold conditions. So it's definitely a concern. And so our recommendation right now is to consider public notices, postings at those areas. Hopefully people are staying home and practicing social distancing. Um, but that doesn't mean someone wouldn't choose to go kayaking down the river by themselves. Um, and so definitely having those no notices, the, the public service announcements, uh, maybe seeking out the media to get that message out as well if you need to, and also restricting access to those areas um, during, particularly during a storm event uh, or a snow melt event, which probably have already seen. And, um, and after that as well, we want to make sure that uh, if it is surviving in, in those waters that we are continuing to provide those protections. So that concludes the, the bulk of the science that we found. And so in summary, we found that infectious coronaviruses and COVID-19 may be present in raw wastewater collected from an infected population, unfortunately. And they may remain infected for a few days in that raw wastewater. Um, we suspect that the biological activity in that type of water does help reduce the infectivity of many of the coronaviruses. But once it's in um, a surface water, its persistence may be extended. Uh, so we want to keep that in mind. Um, and, and that's really what we know right now. We don't have more information on um, what the viral load is in wastewater in an infected community um, into a plant or what the load might be after typical treatment and disinfection. So we want to you know, practice our due diligence with our operators with this knowledge in mind. So there's some critical control points to pull out of the presentation. Uh, these open basins that are operating in our wastewater treatment plant, aerosols or droplets may be created and may fall on surfaces near there. And so we wanna be communicating that risk by signage and staff meetings, <laughs> virtual meetings, um, providing barriers and hand washing stations and routinely disinfecting those surfaces, even if it's just with soap and water. Um, we want to have some provisions for combined sewer overflows and communities that may be at risk. So communicating that risk by signage or media postings um, and preventing or limiting access. And of course, we all know not to be having person in-person meetings and uh, to stay home if you're ill. So that brings me to the infographic, which I'm just going to leave up during our Q&A. Um, and I'll hand it off to Mike to um, to take over the, the Q&A facilitation. So I'll just quickly walk us through here. We have, you know, potential for, it's probably the, the cartoon that you've all created in your mind about what could be happening here. Um, humans who are infected are being encouraged to stay home or in the hospital. And so that's entering our raw wastewater stream. Um, combined sewer overflow events uh, could be contributing these viruses in an infectious state into surface waters and the environment. They may pass through wastewater treatment. Um, they may, I'm down on letter D now, um, and so uh, they may then enter surface water sources that are used for to supply drinking water treatment plants, um, but we expect that current disinfection and treatment practices at drinking water treatment plants to be sufficient for um, removing and inactivating infectious COVID-19. So that concludes my presentation and I am looking forward to hearing what questions you have now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. That was very informative. It's Nick Bankovich here and uh, I've been trying to keep track of the questions. So um, we've had over 20 questions submitted uh, during your presentation as well as uh, you know, uh, another 20 or so prior to. Um, 
many of them have been covered in your presentation. Thank you so much uh, for the detail. And, um, but I think um, some of the ones that, uh, um, that, that we could benefit from hearing and uh, the messaging, um, many people are, are again, uh, really concerned about uh, the type of PPE that their staff are, are, uh, should be wearing in wastewater, particularly. And uh, so um, I think that the uh, uh, reviewing the PPE requirements would uh, address many of the questions that we've just received as well as the preliminary ones. So perhaps to reinforce the, the importance of PPE and masks and, and visors uh, would, be, would benefit uh, a number of the question makers. Okay, that sounds good, Nick. So to review the PPE that we would expect for um, you know, a wastewater treatment operator that may be exposed to aerosols or droplets that are um, being created by these processes and then potentially landing on surfaces in those areas as well. So in terms of specific PPE, um, we wanna be changing our clothes, uh, having specific you know, coverall to um, prevent transmission uh, from the workplace to home or even to the vehicle. So if you are using a shared workplace vehicle, we want that to be being disinfected and thinking about um, you know, transmission from staff sharing vehicles. So we have our, our coverall and then we want to have um, protection <clears throat> for the fecal oral route from your hands to your face. And so we want to be wearing gloves. And gloves are a similar issue to the masks that I talked about where it can give us a false sense of security with respect to um, how clean it keeps our hands and passing the virus around. So when you're wearing gloves, you may um, get the virus on your hands or onto your gloves rather, and then uh, touch other surfaces, which can create um, greater transmission opportunities from one staff member to the next. So we wanna be changing gloves frequently and even though you were wearing gloves, you still want to uh, be washing your hands with at least soap and water, you know, 20 minutes. And we're washing between the fingers, right? And the back of the hands, or 20 seconds, did I say 20 minutes? Um, we wanna make sure that we are, you know, getting all areas of our hand washed in that procedure. So, so gloves, I think, are a good idea to help with an extra barrier between your hands and your face. Um, but we want to make sure we're changing those so we're not then going and flipping a light switch, typing on the keyboard, picking up our personal cell phone, and then the glove actually becomes a vector for transmitting the virus instead of a, a protection. So gloves are good in those situations. Um, and then we, I would encourage more the use of a face shield, so something that you would sort of wear on your head and then you have the shield in front of your face. Um, because it's probably not going to encourage you to touch your face, but it could prevent um, you acquiring droplets on your face. Um, and those can be disinfected between use and reused. Um, and if you are going to be in close contact with another person, you develop a cough at work or fever, you can wear that, uh, that face mask um, and that will hopefully protect others around you as well. Thank you, Nicole. I'm sure that's very helpful to our, our attendees. Um, the next question is uh, from a compliance officer, and they're interested in understanding for administrative staff, how long is it, is it expected that coronavirus lives on paper or similar surfaces that cannot be disinfected? Mm -hmm. Should there be a delay time before handling papers submitted by operators or others? So I did hear this question asked on CBC News to a viral expert, uh, maybe last night. And the recommendation was more with respect to mail. People were worried about mail couriers and that kind of thing. Um, that's the only context I have to answer this question. And the recommendation from that expert was to wash your hands after handling that, those kind of documents uh, to prevent transmission. So obviously there's not an easy method to disinfect paper. I'm not sure if you're going to set up a UV <laughs> disinfection system on your desk. It's probably not very safe and probably not needed. Um, so I think the real risk of transmission is, is from droplets. And so, um, and, and materials that are porous tend to have less persistence of the virus on them. So materials like fabric are known um, 
fabric, cloth bags, that kind of thing are known to have less persistence of the virus than something like plastic that may not be porous. So that might be good context as well. Thank you, Nicole. Our next uh, question uh, is related uh, perhaps to uh, the persistence in the environment and, and the um, now knowing that there's a possibility that um, COVID may be passed through in certain circumstances from wastewater plants into the natural environment. We have a couple of questions relating to that. So I guess the first one, uh, we've had a number of, uh, of our attendees that have asked about how long it survives in the receiving water environment, et cetera. And I know you've gone through those, uh, um, those uh, parameters, but also um, in areas of the province where there are a lot of residents uh, using cottages or even permanent residences that have uh, drinking water, private drinking water intakes that uh, draw from areas where it could be a receiving stream, et cetera. Um, are there special precautions that they should take for those private water intakes? And uh, then the second part of that question would be about what about notices for swimming, et cetera, those type of things. You mentioned it a bit in your presentation. Perhaps we could review those as well to protect the public. Okay, good, good questions. Um, probably many people have these questions. So the first one being about um, these more uh, remote regions that may have intrusion of infectious viruses into their water supply. I would estimate that the risk is not more than what we would see for other human viruses. Um, I don't think that risk is enhanced because we now know about this novel virus. There's a lot that we don't know about this virus. It does seem to be um, more transmissible, at least from person to person than SARS. Like I mentioned, it does you know, have that higher estimated viral load in the upper respiratory tract, which really enhances your risk of getting exposed to an infectious dose and contracting it. And whether it has longer survival in the environment, we don't know. Um, but we know that it um, you know, has similar persistence in the environment and so uh, to other enveloped viruses. Uh, so um, if you are consuming a water supply where you feel like it doesn't have enough it doesn't have adequate disinfection of viruses. You probably have those concerns about other <laughs> enteric viruses as well. So I think those should be addressed whether we have COVID-19 or not. Um, and the second question, part of the question, can you remind me? Um, you have a question on uh, for swimming areas. So oh, soon, yes. uh, you know, we have the children out of the school. There's, there could be swimming areas that are affected by um, partially treated or untreated wastewater spills and uh, what advice do we have for, for those areas where people swim at their cottage or may swim in an area that could be impacted? Great question. Okay, so again, a similar answer in that I don't think the risk is that much greater than um, what we would see for for example, enteric viruses. When we know that when a person is infected with an enteric virus, um, they can shed that virus in their stool, something like you know a million virus particles per gram of stool during the peak infection. So um, when people are ill with these types of viruses, which are more persistent in the environment because they don't tend to have an envelope um, and more resistant to treatment, um, we'd expect to see higher loads of those in the in those at those sites than we probably would for COVID-19. Um, so again, the concern may be more about general public health protection from viruses at sites like that. Uh, but with respect to COVID-19, um, I'm not sure that we need extra signage. But I think the public is very aware that this is an issue. Of course, we have the postings at playgrounds. And so they may respond well to those kinds of notices um, if you have you know, major overflows and impacts. Uh, that should be a consideration. And I expect that we'll learn more, hopefully, before we get into swimming season about you know, the load of, of coronavirus in water. But right now, we really can't comment more about that. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. We also have a, uh, a few attendees that are um, um, looking at uh, uh, municipal stormwater 
and wondering about the concentration that could be found in municipal stormwater and whether these are dangerous for workers that work on the stormwater systems. So certainly in a combined system, um, that would be a concern. Um, and the recommendation, as I mentioned, is you know to not be entering manholes um, unless critical at this time and to be beefing up the PPE and, and the changing of PPE um, for those individuals just to, to prevent that being a vector for a transmission. Um, but I would expect that the concentration in the environment is quite low. We don't have any cases known of people contracting COVID-19 from water. Um, and you know, its survival on surfaces is quite low. It's probably susceptible to UV to some extent in the environment. Um, you know, for example, if it was to wash off of a driveway or, or something like that. So they're expected to be quite diluted and a fairly low risk there. I think the general PPE would be protective of, the, of those exposures. So we have another question um, and I'll read it. If COVID-19 is suspected to be present in feces and possibly at wastewater treatment plants, how can we ensure that author authoritative agencies such as the CDC, public health, etc., cetera, uh, are aware of these findings and can validate this concern and amplify the message? Many municipalities take direction from these authorities and may not be able to take action if authorities don't issue the same warnings to municipalities. Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they are aware. I, I hope I'm not the only person who dug up that information. Um, it's very preliminary information. Having one coronavirus patient having the virus isolated from them in a estimated infectious state is probably not enough data to you know go through a lot of effort and and potentially you know at a extra cost um, and not knowing the the benefit to public health right that's kind of how we have to measure those things so we expect the viral load to be low and we expect uh, to be proactive in our education about overflows, then I think that um, will be sufficient at this time based on the knowledge that we have right now. Um, I think it would, it would be a good idea, it would behoove us to um, push them to fund more research in this area to better understand at these times, you know, when there is going to be a pandemic, whether it's respiratory or not, um, to get on top of that kind of testing. You know, we're lucky that the Netherlands and China had researchers who dug in and, and tested this, but it doesn't seem like that's the protocol. The protocol is more a reactionary and a response, and um, it would be more protective and give us more comfort in our industry, especially if we could have, you know, funds available to to dig into um, the transmission, the persistence, that kind of thing, in a faster way. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, being mindful of our time, I see that uh, there's still a, a question or two that have not, uh, we haven't um, um, been able to get to, um, but perhaps we could uh, include those in a posting, you know, after the fact, so that make sure that we, uh, do, we do provide answers to all of the questions that were submitted. And I think at this time, we should um, move to Mike and uh, move to closing remarks. Okay, thanks so much, Nick. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Nick, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. So much, Nicole. Um, now, before I formally uh, thank Nicole and her team, I did want to mention another webinar that we'll be hosting uh, next week. As many of you know, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation, and Parks recently announced some organizational changes that are happening in the Environmental Assessment and Permissions Division. So, a familiar face that many of you know, Mr. Aziz Ahmed, um, is the manager of this section and he'll be our guest speaker next Friday, April 3rd at 11 a.m. 
Aziz will be discussing the impacts um, on his department um, relating to COVID-19, such as you know, how municipalities navigate the approval process during this uh, provincial emergency. We'll also be working on including a presentation on the emergency order uh, of OREG 2075 and other aspects of operational relief. Uh, this is another must attend free webinar hosted by OMWA for the benefits of our members and the people in the province of Ontario. And I'd like to uh, invite you to send us suggestions that you may have for future webinars. And again, as Nick mentioned, we will do our best to answer any of the questions that we uh, didn't get, uh, Nicole didn't have a chance to answer um, this morning. So now back to Nicole and uh, her team from Stanback, uh, Stantec. Uh, today's webinar would not have been possible without the significant efforts of Nicole McClellan and uh, others, David Pernitsky, Joe Giacangelo, Jeff Paul, and Art Umble. And I think this will go a long way towards uh, bringing clarity and consistent messaging across the water and wastewater industry. So thank you so very much. And I'd also like to thank Ed, Ian, Nick, and a special thank you to Nancy Spagnolo uh, for their work behind the scenes to making this webinar run as smooth, smoothly as it did this morning. I will end the webinar by thanking all of you again for registering. I think we hit our maximum of uh, 500 registrants today. And again, our very uh, just magna really points and, and, and speaks to the importance of, of the topic today and, and the times and the challenging um, things that we're going through uh, on a daily basis. I'm hopeful that uh, you've all found it very helpful and impactful and towards the decisions we will make as we move forward through these challenging times. And may everyone stay safe and healthy as we get through this. And thank you again for attending this morning. Take care.